Great. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the audit committee for Tuesday, March 16th, 2021. Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are closed to the public until further notice in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a health or medical emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the phys physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that will allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present, and that would allow the public to also remotely attend these those portions of the meetings that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's audit committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through live stream on BCPS website. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making or seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Jameson, please call the the role to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Joes. Present. Ms. Pasture. Present. Ms. Rao. Present. Mr. McMillian. Present. Thank you. Ms. Jameson, please call the role of staff attending, excuse me, of staff members participating in today's meeting. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Barr. Present. Ms. Stevens? Present. Mr. Fletcher? Present. Ms. Manna? Present. Ms. Crew? Present. Mr. Edwards? Present. Mr. Saras? Present. Dr. S oh, thank you. Dr. Scriven? Present. Okay, our next item is opening remarks. I'm going to defer to Ms. Barr for this. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I just wanted to make sure that everybody in attendance this afternoon was aware that we did have to make um, updates to some of our presentations so that those uh, presentations were posted last night. So if anybody had viewed them prior to last night, um, they would not be the updated presentation. So I just wanted to make sure that all attendees were aware that they were updated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next item is reports. Our first item in the investigative unit is the investigative unit statistics. And for that, I call on Mr. Fletcher. Thank you, Mr. Edmond. And Mr. Corns, this is the three page uh, PDF. OK, thank you. And so as we present um, our investigative unit update for the month of February, um, you can see uh, we'll go through our, our slides here. Uh, on page one, we talk about our new cases that came in during the month, um, and we did receive only one case uh, in through our hotline uh, in the month of February, uh, was a payroll fraud uh, allegation. And so you can see that there. That brings us to 54 cases uh, for, the fifth, for the fiscal year. Um, and you can see the breakdown here on slide two. Um, and for our year over year analysis, you can see uh, again, fiscal year 21 is the purple line. You can see we are well below um, the prior two fiscal years, again, attributable to the, um, to the, to the current environment. As we go to page two, uh, again, now we're, we're still talking about new cases um, for the month of February and for the fiscal year, but now we're going to talk about how we categorize them uh, in terms of fraud, waste, or abuse. Uh, so the one case that did come in for the month of February was considered a fraud. Uh, so you can see that there. Uh, again, for the fiscal year, for the 54 cases, you can see uh, the breakdown of fraud, waste, and abuse, and, and then other uh, non-fraud, waste, or abuse, that final category. And then the three or the three year uh, analysis, uh, you can see the breakdown there uh, in that third chart on that second page. Um, and again, 
fiscal year 21 is that purple column. Um, and again, uh, we, we do see slight uh, spikes and dips, but as the year moves through, we typically see these level off uh, towards the end of the year. And on page three, uh, now we're going to talk about cases that are closed, um, cases that were closed in the month of February. So we did close two. Uh, one was partially substantiated and one was unsubstantiated. That brings us uh, for the fiscal year to 41 cases closed. Uh, and you can see the breakdown there in that second chart. And then our three year analysis, uh, year over year analysis again, uh, fiscal year 21 uh, is the purple column. Uh, and again, it, it's, it's one of those things where as the, the year progresses, these all tend to level out um, and, and kind of get back onto trend. And that was the month of February for the investigative unit, Mr. McMillian. Thank you. Board members, any questions? Yes, uh, sir, I have one. Yes, please, Ms. Rowe. Um, of the cases that were fraud that were substantiated, can you just break down for us, generally speaking, what type of fraud that was? Uh, I'd hate to generalize. I'd, I'd much rather give you uh, more detailed specifics. Uh, in terms of typically when, when an allegation of fraud is going to come through, uh, it's, it's either going to be uh, a falsification of records, payroll fraud, or theft. Um, those are the, the main um, uh, categories that are, that are going to be considered a fraud. Okay, because with fraud, there's that intentional uh, deception. And so those are the ones that usually fall into that category. Okay, and so... Is it pretty even or is one thing happening more than another? Uh, historically speaking, they, they are all fairly even. Uh, we, we tend to see kind of all of them. Um, I'd say there's no, no one. There's not one that, that is more prevalent than the other. No. OK, so th is there anything unusual about this year from prior years? Uh, no, other than the the current environment, you know, obviously that is uh, making things unusual. I think that uh, uh, to this point has has provided us with less uh, examples of payroll fraud uh, or, or less allegations of payroll fraud. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, I, I think that something like that would be cyclical once, um, uh, not once, but now that we're getting folks back in buildings, um, I think we may see that change. I see. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Board members, any other questions? May I have a motion to accept the investigative unit statistics? So moved. So moved Last row. Two. Second row. Great. May I have a roll call vote, Ms. Jamison? Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Custer? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Four in favor, thank you. Thank you. Our second item is the UHY monitoring update, and for that I call on Ms. Manna. Good afternoon. Um, and Ms. Barr, did you want to give an intro? Yes, thank you. While we're waiting for Mr. Corns to, to bring up the um, update, as the committee is aware, our office continues to monitor the progress related to management's responses and corrective action plan in relation to the UHY audit report that was issued back in April of 2019. And due to the um, ransomware and ransomware attack and the pandemic, we've had to complete our review um, in, in phases. So now this afternoon, Ms. Manna and Mr. Edwards are going to provide a brief overview with regard to the results related to the financial disclosure uh, forms. And that was the only finding that was noted actually in the UHY report. So I will turn it over to Ms. Manna and Mr. Edwards. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barr. If you can go ahead to the next slide, please.
This is some background history of when the UHY report was issued and when BCPS management provided additional feedback and the current st status of the corrective action plan to audit committee members. Back in April of 2019 is when UHY issued their report. At the September um, 2019 audit committee meeting, management provided the audit committee members an update of their correction, corrective action plan at that time. Next slide, please. We completed our testing of the numbered 8 through 12 observations of the UHY report and reported those results at the October 6, 2020 audit committee meeting. A more detailed presentation of those results were presented at that time. Next slide, please. This slide is an overall summary of those follow up results of the observations 8 through 12. Our review included the same offices that were reviewed in the original UHY report and our testing scope was limited to the identified issues and observations in the report. As you can see on this chart, there were findings related in our follow-up for observations 8, 9, and 10, and there were no findings identified in our follow-up for observations 11 through 12. If you can go to the next slide, please. So this is our current status, where we're at now with, with the project. After completing our follow-up of the observations 8 through 12, we started reviewing the corrective action plan and our follow up actions for observations one through seven. During that time, our focus, along with management's focus, was diverted to other initiatives due to the pandemic and then again to the ransomware attack. We started on some follow up work in this area, but then we've had to delay due to access of documentation and focus. Now we are right now working our way back to this part of the report and review at this time. Then once the 2019 deadline for the filing of financial disclosure statements approached, which was uh, November 9th, 2020 was the deadline, we were able to begin the testing of the 2018 and 2019 financial disclosure statements for the same personnel that was included in the original UHY report. The results of this review is the main focus of this presentation. And now Dwayne will review the finding, recommendation, and management management's response from the original UHY report related to this issue. So next slide is for Dwayne. Uh, thank you and good afternoon. On this slide, we discussed the prior UHY finding regarding financial disclosure statements or FDS. UHY reviewed available FDS for board members and BCPS employees, 35 in total for the period January 1st, 2012 to December 31st, 2017. UHY identified 11 board members and five BCPS employees that did not file their FDS timely. Next slide, please. On this slide, we show the UHY recommendation from the prior audit. Basically, UHY recommended that the ethics review panel conduct annual mandatory training for all board members and BCPS employees required to file an FDS. Next slide, please. On this slide, we discuss management's response to the UHY finding and recommendation regarding financial disclosure statements. Management's response indicated it would advise the ethics review panel of the recommendation for mandatory training. Management also suggested that the board ask the ethics review panel to conduct the training prior to the 2020 filings. Next slide, please. On this slide, we discuss internal audits monitoring of the UHY finding. To monitor BCPS compliance with the prior UHY report, internal audit conducted a review of available FDS for 2018 and 2019. We selected the same positions and employees identified in the prior UHY report. If a board member or employee left BCPS since the conclusion of the prior audit, we selected their replacement for testing. The results of this review were, for 2018, internal audit request, requested 36 FDS and 35 were provided and reviewed. 
the 2000 FDS that was not available for review was for a board member who separated with the board in 2018. A paper FDS was sent requesting it to be completed. However, it was not returned. For 2019, internal audit requested 33 FDS and 31 were provided and reviewed. One of the 2009 FDS not available for review was for an employee who resigned in 2019. A paper FDS was sent requesting it to be completed. However, it was not returned. The other 2019 FDS not available for review was for a board member who passed away. No exceptions were noted for these instances since BP, BCPS completed due diligence to request the FDS per policy 8364. Next slide, please. And finally, this slide uh, summarizes our monitoring results. There was one 2019 FDS that was filed 109 days late. The ethics review panel was aware of this and worked with the individual to submit the FDS. Regarding the UHY recommendation on training, there is currently no mandatory training in place for board members and BCPS employees regarding FDS filing requirements and deadlines. On the following slide, Ms. Manna will discuss the timeline of this issue since the conclusion of the prior UHY audit. Ms. Manna. Thank you. When we inquired of the ethics review panel regarding the current status of the recommended training from the UHY report, we learned that the panel and the board chair at the time had met to discuss the training, along with an ethics training to all employees system-wide. And this timeline gives a history of the progression related to the recommended training from the UHY report issuance until now. So in April of 2019 is when the report was, um, UHY re report was issued. In October of 2019, the board chair at the time and ERP met to discuss the financial disclosure statement review process and the employee ethics training. And then in November of 2019, the uh, panel chair issued a letter to the board chair suggesting that the board engage in an outside vendor for both of these trainings. In March of 2020 is when the closures and delays occurred due to COVID. And then in December 2020, the board chair's positions have changed. And then in February, just last month, when we began our follow up and monitoring of the UHY recommendation and corrective action plan is when this is kind of coming back up as an issue now. So at this time, there still is not a formal training for those who must complete a financial disclosure statement. Um, prior to the UHRI report and at this current time, there was and there still is now a PowerPoint presentation on the ethics review panel web page that addresses ethics and it also includes a completion of how to file a financial disclosure statement. However, there hasn't been any additional discussions since the uh, the panel and the board chair may, met last year in, um, well, I'm sorry, late in 2019 regarding a formalized training for this purpose. In our recent discussions with the current panel chair, he recommends that perhaps a training such as the sessions that are within safe schools that is completed through an outside vendor could be looked into for the financial disclosure statement and the ethics trainings. Next slide, please. So since the UHY finding recommendation and management corrective action plan wasn't fully implemented, our follow up monitoring recommendations related to this UHY finding are that the panel and the board should still continue their efforts to develop this mandatory training for employees and for board members who are required to complete a financial disclosure statement. Additionally, the efforts related to a training for ethics uh, for all employees should also be initiated. Next slide, please. The scope of our monitoring review was focused on the UHY finding. However, during our review, we also noted some additional items that came to our attention and we wanted to report on those matters as well. When a panel member reviews a financial disclosure statement, there aren't documented process to, processes to follow, such as an SOP, in order to ensure that all reviews are completed alike. Along with the review of the financial disclosure statement by panel members, 
If there are noted affiliations or interests that could potentially be a conflict with BCPS, there currently aren't any measures or guidelines in place to determine if there should be any next steps that the panel member should follow to inquire about or determine if that affiliation or interest is a conflict. When inquiring about the amendment process, we determined that there currently are not guidelines in BCPS policy related to the following of an amendment. We also learned that the panel follows State Ethics Commission's guidelines for BCPS FDS guidelines. Their website currently has some guidelines related to how and when to file an amendment to an FDS. So these are just some additional matters that we identified and will recommend for management, the ethics review panel and the board to look into. Next slide, please. Now that internal audit has completed the review of the financial disclosure statement findings, we are finding we are going back to observations one through seven of the report to complete that related test work and review. Once that testing is complete, we'll update the audit committee again and we'll compile a complete report of the UHY monitoring of the corrective action plans. And then we'll also work with um, the appropriate personnel to follow up on any unresolved and additional matters that we were identified. So that's that's all for next slide, please. Um, that's the end of this presentation. If there are any questions at this time. Board members, any questions? I have one. Ms. Yes. Rowe, please. Um, has there been any uh, movement on the part of the superintendent staff to develop and provide ethics training and financial disclosure form training through safe schools? At this time, there, there has not been. Our uh, latest communication with the ethics review panel chair is that, that this discussion needs to come up again. Since there is a new chair of the ethics review panel and a new chair of the board, they need to get together to discuss the next steps. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion. Please. Okay. Yes. I've just entered it into chat. I move that this committee move to the full board a recommendation for school staff to facilitate the recommendations for training of ethics and FES training um, as recommended by the Office of Internal Audit. Ms. Rowe, would you like to speak to your motion, please? Well, we have recommendations here and the recommendations have been sent to the um, ethics board, but the ethics board has no authority to actually act on those recommendations. And if the superintendent and his staff have not already acted on the um, recommendations, then I think that this committee should um, forward these recommendations to the full board with a recommendation that the school system develop training for ethics and FDS training because the board does not develop its own training. If this is going to happen, the superintendent's going to have to do it. And so I think that we need to have a board action on this. Any other discussion? Mr. McMillian, I have um, actually I had some questions on the presentation itself um, before, yes, please. but also on the, the motion. It does need so, to be a second. I'm sorry. Do we have a second for this motion? I would be happy to second it after my questions I answered, but not at this time. So can we go ahead with the discussion? Any ideas sure. on that? Yes. So Ms. Mana, the slide that you showed, you said that in October of 2019, a recommendation was made for engaging in an ethics review training uh, to the then board chair or the committee chair? And secondly, that's over a year and a half ago and no action was taken. That is um, um, that is interesting that there was no action taken because I do agree with Ms. Rowe that we don't receive a clear guidance on how to fill out those forms. And um, not just with this board, but even the incoming board next year should receive a, 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 you know, a, a training on how to fill out these forms. Uh, I think that needs to be taken care of. Uh, if you go back to your slide, you showed there were two findings for 2019 uh, that were those both findings with 
was filed 109 days late was one of them. Uh, well, I guess it can be Mr. Hayden since he had passed away was the, the two findings was one Mr. Hayden and the other finding was that a board member or was that a BCPS employee? Or can you reveal that or not? Um, Mr. Quarms, if you can go to the prior sli uh, slide number nine, please. The, the, those were, um, that were discussed here that were not available for, for review, none of those were considered findings. So no, it was not Mr. Hayden's and it was those uh, financial disclosure statements where the employee or board member left and we did not get the paper statement back or Mr. Hayden's, none of them were considered findings. So when you say two findings for 2019 not available for review, are those current employees or board members? They were not available because the employee left or the board member left and the board member who passed away. That's what those two are about. They were not findings. So okay, if you go, so to, go, go ahead, sorry. So if you go, um, go to the next slide, please, Mr. Corns, slide number 10. The one finding that uh, on here related to the statement that was filed late that has that is separate from the prior slide that we talked about this one was the finding the prior slide there are no findings related to that so so is there any action for filing something late because we have a deadline and the board had made a motion to file um, i guess we gave ourselves an extension up to november is what is is this a board member is this an employee because you know there's a lot of weightage put to these financial disclosures um, and I don't know if you can reveal that or not, if it was a board member or employee. Uh, Ms. Jones, if I may, this is Andrea Barr. Right now, our primary concern is that the corrective action plan has not been implemented, so we're very focused on that. And with respect to that particular individual, the ERP and the individual did work together to eventually get the document filed. Now, when we complete our monitoring and issue our final report, we're going to discuss the appropriate appropriateness of including names if necessary with legal counsel. OK, thank you. So what the ethics? Um, I think is that that's the next. Could you go to the next slide, Ms. Mana? I think it's yes. Yeah, so in October 2019, the Board of Education chair and the ethics review panel meet to discuss review process and employee training. So no action was taken after that. That was over a year ago, a year Correct. and a half. Correct. No okay. action has been taken since since that. And do we have a reasoning why? No, I mean, this timeline kind of just shows a little bit, a little bit of a progression of things that occurred that may have set that back, but there's no actual reason. No. OK. Ms. Joes, are you going to second this motion? Can I ask my, may I ask? I'm my, sorry, I'm sorry, Ms. I'm sorry, Ms. Ms. Pastor. Thank Please. you. All right. Um, my question is about, I, I'm unclear about who should have and who needs to initiate uh, the training, the planning for the training, because I think that goes to the motion so who is who's responsible for that you're correct miss pasture that's one thing i wanted to note is that when this came up before as the finding with uhy it was said that since the financial disclosure statements are the responsibility for the ethics review panel that it's the ethics review panel that is responsible for this training and in and working with the board um so it's the between the board and the ethics review panel that needs to do this training. Management does not provide oversight on uh, how the completion of financial disclosure statements. Then that would mean, if I understand the motion correctly, the motion was about management doing this, but in fact, if I'm hearing you correctly, it should be as a result of having a new ethics committee chair and a new board chair, they need to get together and move this. Is that correct or no? That is my understanding, yes. Okay. All right. Then the motion is about management. 
I Is guess when I say, I guess when I say management, I mean the staff liaison in the law office. There is a staff liaison for the ethics review panel. And I imagine that if the board, either way, the board needs to vote to take action on this. I'm happy to reword the motion so that it's the ethics review panel specifically, but the, the ethics review panel doesn't um, possess money or a budget. So I don't know how they would actually provide training without assistance from the superintendent. And so, um, you know, this isn't really going to happen if it doesn't involve any school staff. But I'm hearing the coordination between the board chair and the ethics review chair uh, to plan and execute that and see that the training is executed. Sure, but does this committee still need a motion to make that happen? Because well, that's my point. We have to send a recommendation. Well, yeah, that's exactly my point that first of all, the motion is to management and management uh, and that would be school under su the superintendent. And it does what I'm understanding is that uh, they don't really have the responsibility there. Um, otherwise, it would have been um, termed in that fashion. So do you need a motion is my question um, because it's quite clear that the two chairs need to get it done and previously the two chairs didn't get it done. But um, so that's um, where I'm, so I couldn't second this because I can reword them. I can I mean the motion hasn't been seconded. I can reword the motion so that it's not directly at school staff per se but that the board, the full board could take action on saying, yes, this needs to happen. I guess that's really what I'm looking for is for this committee to recommend to the full board the implementation of the recommendations of the Office of Internal Audits report. Is that better language? I, I, while I agree with Ms. Rowe's sentiments, and I really think we do need the training and every incoming board should get the training. Uh, I think it should be the recommendation should come in, um, should be decided between the ERP and the board chair and um, they need to meet to address the training needs. So I'm, I'm not sure if, about the motion. Ms. Manna, I have a question. Excuse me, Ms. Uh, uh, Ms. Barr. Yes. Okay. Yes. I'm interested in the the timeline on the finished report. You know, is this an ongoing thing, or is it at some point in time it's going to come to an end? There's going to be official findings that then we can say back to the board. These are the official findings. You know, we the report recommends that you know the board chair and and uh, ethics review gets together and establishes in a training program. Is that reasonable that there's going to be an end to this? Yes, there will be an end to the actual project, but because of the ransomware attack and because of the pandemic and, and having to do it in phases, we're, we're making interim reports to the audit committee um, to make you aware of the issues and the recommendations that we have. Because this was the only finding noted in the UHY report and because there has been um, little uh, movement related to implementing the corrective action plan, we felt it was necessary and important to make you aware. And again, our recommendation is that the ERP chair and the, um, the, the current board chair now get together to perhaps uh, rediscuss what was already recommend, recommended by the previous ERP chair and move that along. I believe that, you know, Ms. Rowe makes valid points with respect to costs and things of that nature, where eventually um, whatever the ERP chair and the board chair decide and, and the full board itself with respect to recommendation for training, there will be a price tag associated with that. And there will be expectations, I would think, associated with that to ensure that 
all uh, respective employees attend and take that training and board members. So I think it's going to be a combined effort, but I believe initially it should begin with the ERP and board chair and then they come together and have, I don't know if it would be a motion at that point or suggestions, recommendations to the full board with respect to training, whether that be an in-house training, whether that be an external training. I know the safe schools type of training that Ms. Manna referenced is often used um, by the school system. We've had to attend certain trainings which uh, require us to listen to take a quiz or a test and at the end you have to earn a certain percentage to get your certificate printed out. So um, that would be in line with a lot of other organizations that actually conduct and complete ethics trainings. Um, it's something that I think has has been missing from this organization for a long time. So it would be our hope that we would not wait until our, our um, report is finalized, but that some action would be taken um, sooner rather than later. Thank you. So is it your professional opinion that this is something we should move on now? Yes. Thank you. Miss mm -hmm. uh, 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 Jones has a question, please. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Um, so, Ms. Barr, is this report going to come to the board regardless of whether we make this motion or not? Yes. So should we wait until it comes to the board to make the motion or is this an appropriate time to make the motion to um, ask for training? Uh, I, I do believe that it is appropriate to make a motion to ask for training. Again, because of having to do the um, monitoring in phases and we're not sure what information is going to be available for objectives one through seven and when that will be available, we might not be able to issue a final report for, I'm just throwing this out here because I don't know the answer. It might be four months down the road. So do you really want to lose that amount of time waiting for our final report to be issued when they're the need exists now. And also, I think if, if we could go to slide eight, uh, Mr. Corns, that actually shows our recommendation that might help in the formulation uh, of the motion if the committee so desires. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah, yes, Ms. Rowe, I was just waiting for that, that uh, Oh no, sorry, that was Miss Pastor who I'm that. sorry, I'm sorry, Miss Pastor. You want to go ahead and ask your question while we're waiting for the slide? Go ahead. Sure. I I I my it really wasn't a question. I guess it's a comment that then we can go ahead based on what Miss Barr just said and make a motion to accept the recommendation to bring it to the board or whatever it is she just said. It's 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 her wording. It's pretty cut and dry. So, if we so can get this done, Mr. Mr. McMillian, yes. as the other motion wasn't seconded, I reworded the motion. Um, I move that the committee recommend to the full board that the board implement the recommendations of the Office of Internal Audit in regard to FDS and ethics training provided by the Ethics Review Panel. Yes, I was going to react to that. Do we have a second for this motion? I'll second. So we have a second. Any further discussion on this? Mr. McMahon, I apologize. I don't know what slide you need. Eight? Is this the one? I think Ms. Barr asked for eight. Is that correct? Uh, no, that's yeah. slide nine. Um, eight, where the title of it is management's response. Yes. That. This one? Thank you. Yes. yes. I, I apologize for missing that. You're fine. So what we're saying is that that what happened back in October, there was interaction at the time between the ERP chair and the, the previous uh, Board of Education chair. Then other things happened and things didn't get followed through on. We're just suggesting that the current ERP and board chair get together to establish some sort of program. And again, that that would probably require bringing the information to the full board. Um, thank you. 
So we have a second on this Rose rewritten motion. Uh, any further discussion? Now I would like to read that, but it's scrolled up. I can't find it on my in my chat box. Would you like me to reread it? Yes, please. I move that the committee recommend to the full board that the board implement the recommendations of the Office of Internal Audit in regard to FDS and ethics training provided by the ethics review panel. Mr. McMillian, I have an amendment to that. Yes, Ms. Rose, I've lost my picture and everything. I'm sorry. I like to amend to add um, based on this follow up response that this mandatory training be provided before the 2020 filings. When is the 2020 filing? I believe the board has moved it to June or is it July? I think it's June. June, OK. I did, should we wait and see if staff can even come up with training that fast? I mean, so we make the recommendation. Who knows when the board chair and the superintendent are even going to put this recommendation on the full board's agenda for a vote? So if we set that date, like that's, we could be past that date before this even ends up in the full board because we're still waiting for the charters to be in the full board. Well, I'd like to hear from Ms. Barr. I'm a little worried. I think um, timing uh, is, is most germane here because we're already behind the eight ball. Um, yeah, yes, I, I have no idea how long it takes, but I think this needs to be expedited. I don't want to see it get uh, lost in the proverbial shuffle. I agree with the um, institution or interjection of some sort of, of deadline. I don't know how long it would take to pull some type of, of training together. I don't know if if there is enough time before the, the 2020 filings um, are expected to be in, but it does make sense to me to put some sort of deadline uh, have some sort of deadline associated with the training. Otherwise, it could be another year and a half before that training occurs, you know, as, as Ms. Rowe has pointed out. Thank you. And I would also suggest that if we find that we can't, that they can't meet that deadline, it is easier um, and more forward thinking for them to be able, have to come back and just, and then we have to vote on changing that deadline. But I do think we need to have a limit, time limit. Do we have a second for Ms. Joe's? A second. That? So we have that. Any further discussion on that? Ms. Jamison, can we have a vote on the addendum? On the, not the addendum. Amendment. <laughs> Amendment, please. Yeah, Ms. Joe's? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes, please. Four in favor, thank you. Now we're going to vote on Ms. Rowe's motion. As amended. As amended. As amended. As amended. OK, Ms. Jameson, would you conduct a roll call vote on Ms. Rowe's motion as amended? Yes. Ms. Joes? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes, please. Four Thank you. Can I have a motion to accept the UHY monitoring update? So moved, Ro. Second, past your. Ms. Jameson, please conduct a roll call vote on that motion. Ms. Joes? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes, please. Four in favor, thank you. Thank you. Our next item is unfinished business. Our first item is the OLA monitoring update. And for that, I call on Ms. Barr, please. Yes, thank you. Just very briefly, uh, committee members, we were able to confirm that the contacts that we identified for this project are correct, and we will continue to work with management to complete our review. 
uh, it's my hope that we'll have some additional information to provide at our at our next audit committee meeting. Thank you. OK, I'm assuming I need a motion for this, correct? No. OK, then we'll move on. Uh, thank you. And our next item is new business. Our first item is the overview of investigative process. And for that, I call on Ms. Fletcher and Mrs. Lowry. Uh, excuse me, Mr. McMillian, we missed the. Um... I'm sorry. What did we miss? Operating budget. Correct. OK, that's on me. I accept it. Our second item is the FY22 operating budget analysis. And for that, I call on Ms. Manna. Okay. While Mr. Corns is bringing up that um, presentation related to the personnel analysis, um, I just wanted to make a comment. This is Ms. Barr. I just wanted to make a comment that at our last meeting, uh, the committee wanted our office to complete for further analysis related to the FY22 proposed budget. And for our meeting this afternoon, Ms. Manna and Ms. Crew are going to present information related to FTEs per student enrollment in comparison to other Maryland school systems. So I will now turn it over to Ms. Manna and Ms. Crew. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barr. And Mr. Corns, you can go ahead to the next slide, please. When comparing other LEAs to BCPS for FTE comparisons, we use the following four counties. Montgomery and PG, which are larger than BCPS, and then Anne Arundel and Harford County, which are smaller than BCPS based on their enrollments and appropriations. These school systems were included in this comparison since they provided the FTEs based on the state categories in the same reporting structure as BCPS and were available at the time of our review. Next slide, please. In order to do comparisons on an even playing field and a reasonable comparison with one another, we looked at the total FTEs to the applicable student enrollment numbers and broke it down to display the number of FTEs per 1,000 students. This way, the comparisons are alike. Looking at the FY22 request of FTE and projected September 2021 enrollment, BCPS has 135.74 FTE positions per 1,000 students. Compared to the other four LEAs, Anne Arundel County is the only county out of these four that is below our FTE amount of 1,000 students. In all three of the years, PG County has the highest amount of FTE per 1,000 students. BCPS seems to fall in between the other four LEAs, but is most in line with Montgomery County and FY20 and FY21 but then we drop in FY22's request even below Harford County's request. And I'm noticing one here, we had sent a revision for this slide and I don't believe what's being presented is the revised slide. Uh, we will make sure that that gets updated, thank you. I know it is updated on board docs. So if you look at the board docs presentation on slide three, it, it is the updated numbers. You can go to the next slide, please. This chart is the FY22 personnel request for 1,000 per 1,000 students for all five of the LEAs that we looked at, including Baltimore County Schools. It shows the projected September 30th, 2021 enrollment and the total FTE broken down into each state category. In upcoming slides, we'll have a closer comparison of the administration and mid-level administration categories along with a separate comparison of the instruction and special education categories. In looking at the other state categories here, we noted some big differences in the transportation category. In researching this, we noted that the, um, both Anne Arundel and Harford County rely heavily on contracted services. Therefore, the FTE in this category for those LEAs are much lower. So now next, um, Lauren's going to give a closer look at the uh, administrative and instruction category comparisons. Ms. Crew, you're next. Thank you. Next slide, please. This graph shows the LEA comparisons for the number of administration and mid-level administration FTEs. Administration personnel includes superintendents, cabinet, and other central office personnel, while mid-level administration personnel is like the school-based administration as well as other central office personnel. 
For the administration FTEs, BCPS has fewer than the other school systems shown except for Montgomery County. And for the mid-level FTEs for administration, BCPS has fewer than the others except for Harford County. Overall, Harford County is the only school system we reviewed that has less administration and mid-level administration FTEs with a total of 11.99 FTEs per 1,000 students where Baltimore County Public Schools has 12.31 FTEs per 1,000 students. Next slide, please. This graph is a comparison of the LEAs for the number of instruction and special education FTEs. We also included special and grant revenue funded positions in this graph because majority of these positions are related to instructional and special education FTEs. BCPS and Harford County Public Schools are the only ones that do not break these positions down into the state categories. Uh, the graph shows that BCPS has less, the least number of FTEs per 1,000 students compared to the other LEAs for both um, instruction and special education. In addition, including those special and grant revenue positions, BCPS still has fewer FTEs with a total of 90.67 FTEs per 1,000 students, with the next close this LEA being Prince George's County with 96.19 FTEs per 1,000 students. Next slide, please. This chart shows that BCP, how BCP, BCPS compares to the average of the LEAs we reviewed, including the um, in the comparison for FY 2020 actual and FY 2021 approved. BCPS had more FTEs per 1,000 students than the average. However, for FY 2022 request, BCPS dropped below the average FTEs per 1,000 students compared to the average. Um, now I will turn it over to Ms. Barr. Yes, just to, uh, you can go to the next slide, Mr. Corns. Just in conclusion, uh, we realized that the board recently created a budget committee and we would just appreciate the audit committee's feedback with respect to next steps as to whether or not our office should continue with this type of analysis or if this something or is this something that uh, the budget committee is going to assume um, your feedback and questions related to next steps is appreciated. Thank you. Board members, any questions? I have a comment. Go ahead, Ms. Pastor. Ms. Pastor, please. Thank you. Uh, I think this information is important. Um, and before or while the budget committee is gearing up and processing that question, I would like to see uh, the thinking that you have exhibited in this to continue. This is important information that um, underlies or whatever, um, some serious questions uh, that need to be asked and addressed about staffing. Thank you so much for this information. Mr. McMillian, I have a- Yes, please. Thank you. Ms. Joes. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Um, thank you for this presentation. I, I found it very uh, interesting. And it is, you know, like Ms. Um, Pastor said it is kind of troubling to see that our instruction cost in special education is lowest in comparison. Um, that's something I'm hoping that the budget committee uh, takes up and this board works towards um, putting more money into our instruction and in special education. And I also want to point out that our administrative cost is also lowest in comparisons because there's always the narrative that our administrative costs are high. So that is not true. So I, I love the presentation, but I'm hoping that this is taken up by this board to remedy the deficiencies we have. So thank you for this. Any additional questions, Ms. Rowe? Yes, Mr. McMillian. Um, was there any comparison done as to the overall size? Like, I guess my thing is that I wonder is if we're spending less on instructional FTEs, is it because our overall budget is less than these other jurisdictions? 
or is it because we're spending money on something else instead? And if it's not administrative staffing or FTE, what is it? And that, that's the question that I would like to see the answer to. I would like to still see um, the Office of Internal Audit do these comparisons because you have staff that are particularly um, experienced in this and then maybe this information could be forwarded to the budget committee to deal with. But that that's really the, the next question I have after seeing this is, it's clear that our administrative costs are on par with other school systems, but our instructional spending is not. So what is the reason for that? And is it a lack of money overall, or is it that we're spending money on something else? And Mr. McMillian, if I may. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, I I like um, rather than moving over. I like the um, the relationship between auditing and budget. Uh, the people from both camps having that conversation with each other, as I think so far we've all um, described. And I always go back to Dr. Williams first comment at his comment at the first ANS um, about one department not knowing what the other. I, I just see these two bridging together on this. This is critical information. It's, crit it's critical in terms of the running of the system. It is critical in terms of how we allocate funds and what the budget looks like. Um, so I, again, I'm saying thank you. This is this is great information. Mr. Coons in the audience, and he has a question, please. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Um, if we could go back to slide six, it's the one that shows the instruction slash special education FTEs. Yes, this is the one. So can you explain, is this per thousand students? Correct. Yes, it is. OK. <clears throat> and can anybody explain where the 6.91 um, FTEs actually fall? Is it within special education or straight instruction? I can answer that one. This is uh, Ms. Crow. Um, a lot of them do fall in special education because a lot of the special and grant revenue received is in special education, but there are some that fall in special case, special um, in regular instruction, as well as there are some that aren't related to instruction at all. However, with Baltimore County Public Schools not uh, separating them by the state categories, we put it all there just so you, even you taking those into consideration, it does show that Baltimore County Public Schools is less. Right, and <clears throat> I think it's already been pointed out that this is basically the most disturbing slide <laughs> that I've seen today um, because instruction and, and academic achievement is is the reason we exist. And what I'm what I'm understanding from the slide, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that we we our LEA is putting forth the least number of um, instructors out of all of these LEAs that we're being compared to. Is that, would that be an accurate statement? Based on this slide, it does appear that way. Okay. All right, thank you. That's Any all. additional questions? May I have a I have, Excuse I'm me, sorry. I'm sorry. I have one more question, Mr. McMillian. This is Lily Rowe. Um, so that, that slide that we were just looking at, did that include all instructional FTEs like reading specialists and paras and everything? I don't know exactly what all is included in instruction. It's based on what the state, uh, the county's report for state, uh, the state categories. Uh, my understanding is it would include most of those. Okay, so if it's based on the state categories, then it's it's comparable one LEA to another. In other words, I just want to make sure there's not some instructional FTEs out there in Baltimore County somewhere that somehow didn't get included in this because of the way we report. This is strictly based on, however, the county's report. 
report to the state, which I'd expect it to be a standard that the state requires. OK, thank you. May I have a motion to accept the FY22 operating budget analysis? So moved, Ro. Can I have a second, please? Oops, second past you up. OK, Mr. Kuhn is typing something. Goodbye. That's all. OK, <laughs> Ms. Jamison, would you conduct a roll call vote, please? Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes, please. Four in favor, thank you. Thank you, and our next item is new business. <laughs> our correct, yes. Our first item is the overview of investigative process, and for this, for that, I call on Mr. Fletcher and Mrs. Lowry. Thank you. Oh. Good afternoon. This is Ms. Barr again. While Mr. Corns is pulling up the um, actual presentation, I just wanted to give a brief um, introduction that at our last meeting, our committee had questions related to our investigatory process. So this afternoon, Mr. Fletcher is going to present a brief overview of our process related to the investigation of fraud, waste and abuse allegations. And I wanted to uh, send out appreciation to Ms. Lowry, the Acting Chief Human Resource Officer, and Ms. James, the Director of Office of Employment Dispute Resolution, um, for being here this afternoon to explain what their office does once they receive our report. So now I would like to turn that over to Mr. Fletcher. Thank you, Ms. Barr. Uh, Mr. Corns, if you can take us to the next slide, please. Uh, so. As Ms. Barr explained, uh, we're going to walk through the investigative process um, at a very high level uh, just to, to kind of explain how we move from receiving a, an allegation all the way through to uh, issuing our report and, and working with the uh, Department of Human Resources uh, to resolve the issue. Um, so if you would, Mr. Corns, take us to the next slide, please. We'll start with the notification of, of the allegation. So when we kick off a project, um, we're, we're receiving an allegation and we can receive that through multiple channels. Um, primarily, we receive it through our hotline. Uh, we, we have a, a hotline called Ethics Point. Uh, it is a fraud, waste and abuse hotline. Um, it is open to the public. Anyone can access it, whether they're an employee, not an employee. Uh, they can remain anonymous or, or provide their information should they so uh, choose to do so. Uh, they can also access this hotline either through the phone. Uh, there, there's an 800 number that they can call uh, or they can go on to the website uh, and, and actually go through and, and enter in their information themselves. themselves. Um, there's also other channels, obviously, that we can receive it. So we can receive something through uh, the mail, whether it be inner office mail or, or uh, the postal service. Uh, we receive emails with with allegations. Um, we, we still get it the old fashioned way. Sometimes we'll, we'll receive a phone call uh, or somebody will stop by and, and pick. Uh, uh, stick their head in, in the office and, and talk to us um, and so verbal interactions as well. So all these different methods um, are, are out there for us to receive uh, the allegations. Uh, Mr. Corns, if you take us to the next slide, we can talk about now how we go through and do our, our preliminary assessment. So how we're going to analyze uh, this allegation that, that has come in front of us. So the first thing we want to do, and, and you guys will be very familiar with this from the presentations that I do each month, but the first thing we're going to do is go ahead and categorize those. So we're going to consider it first and, and define it. Is it going to be fraud, waste, or abuse? And, or, or does it fall outside of that? So one of those four categories. Um, We'll go through, we'll do that, and then we're going to figure out the additional subcategory. And that's going to be, uh, as you see here, the theft, payroll fraud, misuse of resources. Um, th those are obviously the, the big ones that we do see frequently. And based upon that information, uh, we're then going to take a look and determine what our, our methodology is going to be. How are we going to um, uh, approach this investigation? And so, we have have several options here. First one, obviously, uh, Office of Internal Audit will go ahead and conduct the investigation. So that's typically where we're going to see a, a actual allegation of fraud, waste or abuse. Um, the second method would could be 
we send it to management for their investigation and we'll request a response back. Um, a, a nice easy one to, to kind of give you some uh, some perspective for this one is we receive an allegation that uh, a student is attending a school that they don't live in that district. They, they shouldn't be attending that school. We're not going to investigate that. We'll we'll send that information out um, to our our PPWs. Uh, let them do their you know that's their their normal course of work. Let them do their review. They'll send that information back to us and then we can take that information, include it into a report and, and complete the project. Um, the third step uh, or the third thing that we may do uh, would be to send it to management for informational purposes, but not re require a response back from them. And that's typically for um, information that comes through the hotline that may not really be an allegation of fraud, waste or abuse. Uh, it may just be something along the lines of um, you know that uh, I have graffiti on on the school, or there's there's trash in the playground, things like that, where we need to get it taken care of. Um, and and so it's not that we can just you know not address it at all, but it's not appropriate for us to investigate. So we get it to the right folks, um, allow them to handle it. But since it's not fraud, waste, or abuse, we're not going to require a response for that type of information. Uh, and then the fourth thing is if we've received uh, that information, whether it be through the hotline or, or however, if we have a way to communicate with the reporter, we may need additional information to figure out which one of these methods we actually uh, would like to choose or, or would be able to choose. And so sometimes we will reach back out to that reporter and um, request additional information. Okay, and Mr. Corns, if you would take us to the next slide, please. And so for those that uh, that we keep within the Office of Internal Audit, um, we're going to go ahead and, and next step for us is going to be to uh, perform our field work and conduct our investigation. And the investigative steps, they're going to vary from investigation to investigation. Truly no two are, are the same. We do have some that are that are very similar because of the nature of the allegation or, or things like that. But for the most part, uh, there are so many nuances in each allegation that, that they are truly different. Uh, however, some of the common steps uh, that we're going to do uh, in our investigation uh, are going to be conduct interviews, uh, including the subject of the allegation. Uh, we'll also review documentation. Uh, we're going to perform uh, analysis, uh, certainly test any applicable data uh, that may help um, provide information into that allegation. And we'll go through, perform all of these steps, uh, all in an attempt to determine uh, whether or not the allegation is is true or not. And so what we do is we're once we complete that, we're able to then determine whether or not we can substantiate the allegation. And again, from our, our monthly presentations, I'm sure you're familiar with these terms, but but just to roll through them again, uh, we can either substantiate, partially substantiate, unsubstantiate, or, or come up with an inconclusive uh, uh, determination based upon the information that we find uh, during the course of our investigation. Okay, Mr. Corns, if you take us to our next slide, please. Okay, so once we get to that determination, we're now ready to uh, produce our, our, provide our results and, and issue our report. Uh, we have one of, of three reports that we can do. So for our allegations that are fraud, we produce what is called a fraud examination report. Um, it looks identical to an investigative report, uh, which is what we use for allegations of waste, abuse, and, and other um, non-fraud waste or abuse allegations. Those two look identical. It's just we, we give them different headers so that we can uh, delineate our, our fraud uh, reports from the others. Then the third type that we will issue uh, is our memo to file, and that's for those uh, that I was mentioning before, where we'll we'll send it to management, uh, we'll send the information that we've received uh, to management, but we won't request a response back. Uh, so so those types of things, we'll we'll close those allegations or we'll close those cases with memos to file, uh, so that we can see that we have addressed it, um, just in case anything should come back in in the future related to it, we we'd still have that history. 
Uh, and so when we issue our reports, and now I'm talking about our fraud examination and our investigative reports, it does have a very limited distribution. Um, the recipients are the superintendent, the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the acting chief of human resources, uh, our boss, the, the chief uh, auto executive, Ms. Barr, and uh, Ms. Howie, Howie, the uh, head of the law office. So those were the recipients of our reports. Um, and then from that point, um, we often then work with HR and Ms. James, uh, I believe as we move into this next slide, lets you hop in there. Good evening. Um, as Keith mentioned, um, the distribution um, is kept pretty small um, after um, their office has completed the investigation and they have their report. Um, a report is distributed to Ms. Lowry, our um, chief. What happens at that point is Ms. Lowry will review that investigation report for additional violations or clarification. And what could happen at that point is we'll, we'll have discussions on if there's going to be any disciplinary action, if this is a matter where an office needs to be educated, and we'll also look for uh, additional findings and determine if there needs to be further investigation. So an example of that would be um, if there is a recommendation or if there's evidence or facts found where a child has been, that there's been a suspicion of child abuse or neglect, then the matter would be referred to the Office of Investigations and Records Management for that to conduct that portion of the investigation because we would then need to talk with um, students, um, parents, and the accused. Um, if there is a financial discrepancy and we determine that there was not necessarily um, theft, but maybe this was a performance issue where there were some arithmetic errors, then we understand we would refer that back to the administrator so that that individual could receive either further training or maybe there needs to be some discussion on demotion. So those are just some possible um, ways in which we can have some discussion on what happens with the employee at that point. Once we determine what the disciplinary action is, we then work to distribute that report to the parties. And that distribution is done through the executive director. And at that point, the executive director would meet with the employee and the employee would receive, receive a copy of the report. If the findings were substantiated or partially substantiated, there may be some disciplinary action. And at that point, the um, executive director would communicate that with the employee or with uh, the principal or the manager who would be having those discussions with that employee. If the employee is going to be exited from the school system, then the Department of Human Resources would distribute that report. Um, if before COVID-19, we would meet with that individual personally and they'd get a copy of that report along with their um, representative in the meeting if they choose to have that person there. And it would move further um, to meet with our um, hearing officer. If at any point during the investigation, we feel as if the employee may need to be removed from contact or placed out on administrative leave, then um, our office does have that conversation um, with the auditors. And if it seems as if the person just needs to be out of the workplace and we will work to remove them and place them in an alternate work assignment. However, if it seems as if it may be performance related we may keep that person in the assignment, but just remove them from carrying out those essential functions of that position. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you, Ms. James. And then as um, uh, the Department of Human Resources goes through and, and completes their review, they'll send us uh, a notification of disposition. Um, and so once we receive that, we're then able to say, okay, um, we know that they've received our information. They've gone through and, and um, um, gone through their process. We can now uh, put it on the clock in terms of when we can release it to, um, or, or release it for uh, uh, Ms. Barr. How do I want to say that? Uh, to the board. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Release that to the board at that point. And Mr. McMillian, I, I 
as we slide in or move into our last slide, uh, Mr. Corns, Mr. McMillian, I, I turn it back to you. Thank any you. Questions or comments? Thank you. And I want to thank Miss James for representing Mrs. Lowry. I introduced Mrs. Lowry, but it turns out it was Mrs. James. Thank you. Uh, board members, do we have any questions? I have one, Mr. McMillian. Yes, please. This is Ms. Lily Rowe. Rowe. Um, so I would like to know when you have a situation where somebody calls the hotline for Office of Internal Audit and they report something that then gets forwarded to HR, particularly if it may end up resulting in disciplinary action of other employees, what is done to protect the identity of the person who made the complaint so that they are not retaliated, retaliated against by other employees who may now be subject to disciplinary action because of the complaint? Okay, um, so I want to answer that in, in pieces. Um, and then Ms. Barr and Ms. James, if, if you'd like to add in as we go. Uh, first and foremost, it's anything that, that is, uh, that we're, we receive, um, whether it be through the hotline um, or a phone call or, or even mail, um, I want to say our, our anonymity rates around 85 to 90 percent. Uh, so we've received very little information where a reporter will actually identify themselves. Um, however, once we receive that information and, and uh, we started to, to do our investigation, whether it's something we do in the Office of Internal Audit uh, or if it's something that we pass along to management, um, there are still um, board policies, or, I'm sorry, policies or rules that um, obviously prohibit um, any type of, of retaliatory action and, and things like that. Um, and it's it, it um, not only prohibiting, uh, but then also um, provides uh, protections for the people that, that bring issues forward. Um, so that is in, in rule and policy already. Uh, Ms. Barr, Ms. James, anything you guys would like to add? Just to kind of piggy pack off of what Mr. Fletcher has said, um, when it, when an employee is brought in to con for an interview, uh, that process is anonymous as well. So what we will do is we will, um, and I'm pretty sure their team it's the same. Um, we will meet the employee. Um, we can meet them somewhere at Panera Bread, um, or they're coming into our offices right now. Since we are able to do this virtually. Um, we can conduct those interviews virtually such that the supervisor does not is not always aware that those interviews are taking place. They are aware of the allegation against them, but not necessarily who made the allegation. And if it when it gets to the point where um, the supervisor is brought in, it's typically at the end of the investigation after, after we've kind of assessed what all the facts are and what all the allegations are. And at that point, we may make the decision to remove the person so that if we do suspect that they may be making some type of negative um, employment action against the employees that have reported them, it is very rare um, that that happens. Or if we decide that we are going to um, discipline that supervisor where they may be removed or they um, from their duties mean they were going to be demoted or terminated or reprimanded, um, that person is typically, um, if we're going to the extent of that type of discipline, that person may be administratively transferred if we suspect that they may retaliate against the individuals who have reported them. So those are some of the protections that we have. But again, that's typically at the end of the investigation once we have all of our findings. Ms. Barr, did you want to add anything? No, I, I, I um, thought of most of the cases that we receive really are reported to us anonymously, so we really don't know. Um, and I agree with the statements that Ms. James made with respect to the investigatory process. Um, once we start an investigation, we're very careful to protect the identities of those that we um, interview, but we also know that once you start to interview one person and then you interview the next person and the next person, even though we request confidentiality, we know that confidentiality may not always be maintained by the individuals that we are interviewing. However, the expectation in our office is that that does remain confidential. Thank you. 
Board members, any other questions? Ms. Barr, I have a question or to Mr. Fletcher or whoever. As a former teacher, at, let's suppose somebody called up and made an allegation against myself. At, at what point in this process do I become aware that there's an investigation going on? And and yeah, please answer that. Sure, it, it would be the, the point in time where we actually reach out um, to you as the subject of the um, of, of the investigation. When we reach out to you and, and uh, set up a, a time to meet with you. So is there any, is there, if, if, if you, if, if it was unfounded very early on in the process, would I still be informed that my name was brought up? Uh, potentially. It would depend on the allegation and it would depend on if it was completely unfounded or if there were still some outlying questions that we would need answered. Um, if there were still a few things that, that um, it, it would make sense for us to speak with you, then yes, we would still contact you and, and go through that process. Um, but if it was something as, as simple as um, Mr. McMillian was um, in California on Tuesday and we were able to show without a doubt you were in Chesapeake High School on Tuesday, then, then we would probably squash that pretty quickly and, and you would not be aware of that, no. Thank you. Certainly. Any other questions, board members? May I have a motion to accept the overview of investigative process? So moved, Roe. Ms. Roe, do I have a second, please? Second, Pasteur. Ms. Pasteur. Ms. Jamison, can we have a vote on this, please? Roll call vote. Yes. Ms. Joes? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes, please. Four in favor, thank you. Announcement. Announcements. The next meeting of the Audit Committee will be on Tuesday, April 13th, 2021 at 4.30 p.m. Uh, is there any further business? Mr. McMillian, I have one question. This is yes, Ms. please. Do you have any updates on when the audit charters will appear on the full board agenda? No, I don't. And if you recollect, I mentioned that at the last, I've mentioned it several times at the board meetings under comments and most recently this past meeting. And I have not had any correspondence back from anyone in relation to the charters and or putting the quarterly reports on the agenda. But okay, I'll, I'll follow up on it for you. Thank you. OK, and I would like to say something before. Now, I know Mr. Kuhn has has withdrawn from the meeting. However, he emailed Ms. Barr and I on a topic in the last few days, and I'm not sure exactly when, whether it was yesterday or it was maybe Friday. And I just want to assure, you know, I want to put it out there that we're going to respond to Mr. Kuhn's email. And, and I didn't think it was the timeliness was such that we should put that topic on this agenda. So we're going to respond to Mr. Kuhn and then we're going to go back and forth with some correspondence. And if we decide that that topic needs to be on the agenda, then we'll do it on the agenda. OK, thank you very much. Uh, may I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved, Roe. Ms. Roe, do I have a second? Second. Ms. Ms. Joes is a second. Uh, Ms. Jamison, can we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Joes? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes, please. Four in favor, thank you. Since there's no further business, this meeting is adjourned at 557. So we had a one hour and 23 minute meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone have a good evening. Thank you. Thank have you. a good evening.